We do want to welcome everyone who is worshiping with us today, both in person and folks who are joining us online. If you're worshiping with us online, do be sure to say hi in the comments or give the video a like so we know that you are worshiping with us. Uh, we are so glad that you can join us for worship in this way. Today, after worship at 2.30, we are going to Godspell downtown at the Headbeck Theater. Um, Bob has your tickets if you pre-order tickets, so do see him to pick yours up. Um, otherwise, let folks know Bob will be there at 2.10 outside the theater if you need your tickets that way. Um, so that's today at 2.30. Uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., our uh, grief group is gathering, and we're going to be back in our Zion room now that the air conditioning is working in the Ed building once again, um, so that group will meet in there. Wednesday at 6.30, we have council on Zoom, and Thursday at 11 a.m., we have our Golden Friends road trip to Carriage on the Square Smokehouse. Can I see a show of hands of folks who are planning on attending that? Okay, I'm going to be sending out some texts and calling folks and asking too. Um, we will meet in the parking lot here at Zion at 11 a.m. and then carpool down together. If you are able to drive, do let me know after worship today so I can make sure that we have enough drivers. I can drive, no problem, um, but I do want to make sure we have enough folks. I'm really excited. They've got great food, and I am so excited about trying all the ice cream flavors that I can. So it's going to be a good day. And then Saturday at 6 p.m., we will be here in our sanctuary for a Taze meditative worship service. Um, our choir is going to help lead us in one of those songs that we'll be singing, and we're going to try to do it in a round today, so we'll see how that goes. Um, some of the songs we sing Saturday will be familiar, some of them won't, um, but the today service is an opportunity to just um, be in God's presence in this quiet, meditative way, to sing songs together, to read scripture, and to pray together, and I think it'll be a really enriching service. And then afterwards, we are going to gather for some ice cream treats. So two chances to have ice cream this week here with us at Zion. And then next Sunday after worship is our third Sunday lunch. We're heading to Tony D's in New Pal. Um, they've got some great food. It's a fun place to hang out. Do let Becky know by Wednesday if you plan on attending that lunch. We have reservations for 11.15, 11.30, um, for 12 people right now, so we need to know if we need more seats. So do let Becky know um, if you want to join us for lunch next Sunday. It feels like we packed everything for the month of August into just this one week, so we'll have a little break the next week. Today we are continuing in our generosity worship series. I'm excited that Paula Pringy is going to share for us her story of generosity and how she learned about generosity and the ways um, that generosity is an important part of our faith. Next Sunday, Michelle is going to share, and then right now, the Sunday after that, August 27th, is still open. Um, so if after hearing Paula's story, you feel so inspired to share your own story, uh, please sign up today or let me know as soon as possible if you would like to fill that spot. Um, a couple other announcements. We are hoping to have a treasure trunk sale on Saturday, September 23rd. So that's a little over a month away, but it will be here before we know it. Um, Becky and Joe are going to help organize that for us once again. You can get two parking spots for $15. Um, and we're also going to have lots of stuff from Zion out on that sale as we've been making space in our education building for new possibilities. Um, there's some things that have served us well, and we are hoping that we can find some new homes for those items. We'll have a chance for you all to go in and take a look at the things that we're planning on putting on the sale. So if there's something that you need or something that you know we need to keep, if there's a story behind it or something, you can 
uh, enlighten us on that, or if there's something that you want uh, to take home with you, you will get first dibs on that. Um, in preparation for that sale, we are going to have another Ed Building Workday on Saturday, September 9th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're going to uh, look at the closet and the gym and the loft and some other spaces, making sure that we're keeping those tidy um, and don't have extra stuff that um, we don't need anymore. So get those dates on your calendar, Saturday, September 19th. No, Saturday, September 9th for the workday, and Saturday, September 23rd for the sale. A reminder that our choirs are both kind of mostly on break until September. Um, I know our choir has been helping us get ready for today's service, um, but the choirs will be resuming their regular schedules, chancel choir singing the second Sunday of the month, bell choir playing the last Sunday of the month, starting in September. And finally, we are looking for a new volunteer to act as the liaison to our Boy Scouts. So don't everyone jump at once for this opportunity, uh, but we are looking for someone who can help us with our scouts, just with communication, making sure we're keeping up on their charter, uh, making sure that we are a good charter organization, supporting the work that our scouts do. Um, we do have some really great people in the scouting organizations that we support, and having that person who can help with communication with them is a really important role that we need to fulfill. In the meantime, I'm working with them, trying to make sure we've got things set for the year ahead for them, um, and they're working at revitalizing our Cub Scout pack. So there's going to be some exciting things coming up. If you're interested in that role at all, please do let me know. I would love to share more with you about it. Those are the announcements that I have for you today. We've got so much coming up in the life of our congregation, and it's such a blessing to be able to gather in all these different ways as church. Let's ready our hearts this morning for worship as Martha plays for us our prelude. together as the people of God, gathered here on this holy ground, gathered online, gathered at home, in order to seek God's guidance, God's care, and God's love. Our generous God provides for our needs and has given us more than enough that we might care for ourselves and our neighbors too. In response to the outpouring of our God, let us bring our abundant 
and extravagant praise. I'd like to invite the choir to come forward to help lead us in that to say song, Prepare the Way of the Lord. And you are invited to turn to page 174 in your hymnal as we sing together this song. So like I said, our choir is going to help lead us in this song, and we are going to try doing this in a round today. The first time through, we are going to all sing together in unison. The second time through, this side, the piano side of the sanctuary, is going to start singing first on the second time, and then this side is going to join in as we do the round um, on that second time through, and then we'll keep doing the round one more time through. So our choir is going to help lead us through that as well, um, and we'll see if we can learn this so that Saturday we can do this together too. <laughs> You give us guidance in the wilderness of our lives. You give us sustenance for the journey ahead. You give us friends to help us along the way. God, may we never forget your faithfulness. As we gather for worship, God, knowing that you are here among us, we ask that you hear now our prayers, O great and generous God. We lift up to you all those things that are on our hearts in these moments, our joys and our sorrows. God, it is a tremendous gift and blessing each and every time that we can turn to you in prayer. It is a wondrous thing when we can gather as church, as the body of Christ, to bring our praise to you. God, we give you thanks that you have heard the prayers of our hearts this day. We give you thanks that you have heard those prayers that we lifted up just a few moments ago as a congregation. Prayers for those in our lives who are hurting, troubled in these moments. We pray that you pour out a spirit of comfort and care upon those we named. God, we lift up to you, too, our neighbors in Hawaii, our siblings who are in need of your help in these moments as they face the aftermath of these wildfires, as they face the devastation that is before them. God, help us to find ways to care for our neighbors. May they know of your support and your encouragement, and God, may we do better caring for your creation, this beautiful world that you have given to us. 
God, be with those who are crying out to you in these moments, facing a wilderness like they have never known before. Be with all of those first responders as they put their lives on the line, as they offer their gifts and their talents and their care for those who are in need. God, be with your people around the world, that they might know of your care, and be with your church, that we might be your hands and feet, living out your generous love. God, we lift up to you these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our friend, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd now like to invite Paula Prangy to come forward and share with us her story of generosity. Generosity is a hard subject to talk about because we seem to be boasting about people, but here goes. I was married to the most generous man I've ever met. I watched him give his time, his leadership, and his monetary gifts to the church, to the family, and to his friends. His greatest gift of generosity was his listening time. He would let you talk without interruption. Then when you finished, he would take a minute and then tell you why he agreed or disagreed and explain how he came about his decision. It made you feel like he really cared about your opinion, even if he disagreed with you. He was always available for band contests, show choir and basketball games. The girls would tell you his favorite saying was, if there is something you want or need, make a plan and give it to me, then I will see how I can help you. I couldn't begin to tell you how many times he was on council, either as president or vice president. He loved the church and a congregational meeting which was brought him, is what brought him here the day he died. He was my mentor, the one who taught me to love the Lord, believe in his promises, and how to be generous. I believe the Bible is a never-ending source of example of how to live a rich and rewarding life of generosity. My favorite song is 40, and from line 4 we read, Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. As most of you know, I was a city girl who married a farmer. Reaping and sowing was not part of my everyday vocabulary. However, those two words have become the foundation of my generosity. There are a lot of examples in the Bible, such as Psalm 126, verse 5. Those who sow in tears will reap with unfailing love. And from, oh, I'm sorry. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. From Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, sow for your righteousness and reap the fruit of unfailing love. And a very familiar one comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. I've been blessed in many ways, but the most blessing I've ever received is seeing these words in action. How many times have I sit on council and say, if it is a need, the council should set the example of giving and let the congregation take it from there. It worked every time. We have been blessed to be a blessing to each other, to the church family, and our own family. 
I have been blessed with enough funds to help the church my girl and family members along the way. I have always been reimbursed by a generous God who in turn blesses me more. However, sometimes generosity is a two-way street. You must be willing to ask for help, and in turn that person might return the blessing of help back to you. Just like Pastor Sarah asked me if I would say something about generosity in her home, fumbling it up. Generosity comes in many forms, not just money, time, listening, leadership, and most importantly, the belief that the Word of God, written in the Bible, is a moral compass that leads us to live a fulfilling and generous life. Thank you. A big thank you to Paula for that witness that she shared about generosity. Um, we know that Bruce's legacy is still living on here at Zion because of how generous he was and because of how he shared of his faith with so many of us. And for that, we are incredibly grateful. Last week, we witnessed the generosity of the Good Samaritan and the way that he gave of his time, his talent, his resources, and his love in order to serve one in need. Through Jesus' generous teaching, we saw that generosity can be life-giving and life-saving. We remembered that we are called to do likewise and go out into the world with generous hearts to love and serve our neighbors. Today we are exploring God's generosity in Exodus 16. Our liberating God heard the cries of God's people in slavery in Egypt and rescued them, leading them out into the wilderness to journey to a new land. It took courage for God's people to leave behind all that they had known, and when life in the wilderness got challenging, God's people weren't so sure they had made the right decision. We'll see that they were ready to just give up. But God hears their cry once again, and once again, God shows up for them with a generous heart. Exodus 16 is the story of how God provided for God's people in the wilderness with manna from heaven. It's a story about who our God is, a generous God who cares about us and provides for us. But it is also a story about who we are to be as God's people. And it gives us insight into how God invites us to live. We so often live into this scarcity mindset, believing that there is never enough to go around. We let that take over sometimes, living with anxiety and worry about what tomorrow may hold or doing all that we can to try to ensure that we have what we think we need, even if that means that others have to go without. This passage that we are about to hear is one that is challenging and also one that is freeing. As we hear God's word today, listen for what it says about God's generosity and what it might be saying about the resources we are given. Like last Sunday, you'll be invited to name aloud what you notice. This is Exodus 16, and I'm going to invite Colin and Greg to come forward and help bring this word to life. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the Sin Desert, which is located between Elim and Sinai. They set out on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, 
Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instruction. On the sixth day, when they measure out what they have collected, it will be twice as much as they collect the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the Lord's glorious presence. Because your complaints against the Lord have been heard, who are we? Why blame us? Moses continued, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning because the Lord heard the complaints you made against him. Who are we? Your complaints aren't against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole Israelite community, Come near to the Lord, because he's heard your complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole Israelite community, they turned to look toward the desert, and just then, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses. I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will have your fill of bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes, as thin as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? They didn't know what it was. Moses said to them, This is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Collect as much of it as you can eat, one omer per person. You may collect the, for the number of people in your household. The Israelites did as Moses said, some collecting more, some less. But when they measured it out by the omer, the ones who had collected more had nothing left over, and the ones who had collected less had no shortage. Everyone collected just as much as they could eat. Moses said to them, Don't keep any of it until morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. Some kept part of it until morning, but it became infested with worms and stank. Moses got angry with them. Every morning they gathered it, as much as each person could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, the people collected twice as much food as usual two omers per person. All the chiefs of the community came and told Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a day of rest, a holy Sabbath for the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. But you can set aside and keep all the leftovers until the next morning. So they set the leftovers aside until morning, as Moses had commanded. They didn't stink or become infested with worms. The next day, Moses said, Eat it today, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you won't find it out in the field. Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be nothing to gather. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather bread, but they found nothing. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to obey my commandments and instructions? Look, 
The Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you enough food for two days. Each of you should stay where you are and not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The Israelite people called it man. It was like coriander seed, white and tasted like honey wafers. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept safe for future generations, so that they can see the food that I used to feed you in the desert, and when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put one full omer of manna in it, then set it in the Lord's presence, where it should be kept safe for future generations. Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses, and he put it in front of the covenant document for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna for forty years until they came to a livable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is one-tenth of an epoch. Thank you, Colin and Greg, for help bringing that scripture to life for us today. Friends, in the Holy Scriptures, we find God's Word. We find those things that can help us live good and fruitful lives. I invite you to go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Good and loving God, we give you thanks for the many ways that you provide for us. We give you thanks that in those wilderness times, you show up for us in our need. We give you thanks, God, that you give to us more than enough. Help us to see this world through your eyes, God, where there is enough to go around. May we be generous in our living and in our faith. God, bless this time of study that we have together, and may the words of your servant be ever faithful. Amen. So that question that I posed for you, what does this passage tell you about our generous God, and what insight does it offer about the resources that we have been given? You are invited to name aloud now those things that you notice if you want to. God is patient and he keeps his promises. God is patient and he keeps his promises, yes. Again and again, God's like, why don't you listen to me? But God keeps trying. Anyone else? God provides our daily needs. God provides for our daily needs. Thank you, Pastor Harrison, and it's nice to have you in worship with us. What else do you notice in this passage? Okay, keep sitting with that and thinking about it, um, and I will share some things that I noticed. We see in this story that each day God provides exactly enough. Exactly enough to help God's people make it through their wilderness journey. God invites them to find balance and to be intentional about what they gather. If you gather too little, God makes sure that it is enough. But if you gather too much and try to snatch away the excess, God also finds a way to make sure that you, too, have just enough. In the vastness of the wilderness, God is able to make a way for God's people to have enough, and to have enough means to have life. Finding that kind of balance in our lives of enough can be so challenging especially in our society where the dominant message is that we can never, ever have enough, that there is always more to be had, that even we ourselves are not enough. God's generosity in the wilderness reminds us that God provides enough to go around. 
It might not take the form of flaky, dusty-looking stuff on the ground or flocks of quail flying around us, but still in this incredible world God has given us as our home, there is enough. How might that idea, if we really lived like we believed it, how might it shape how we live our lives each and every day? Did you know that if we wanted to, if we really worked together, we could end world hunger? In an article called, How Much Would It Cost to End World Hunger? The World Food Program says that global hunger has been called the world's most solvable problem. Even with the impact of the pandemic, rising food costs, the climate crisis we are facing causing drought and wildfire and extreme famine, and the war in Ukraine that is placing a burden on our food resources and a whole host of other factors, still we could end world hunger if we wanted to. The World Food Program USA has determined that there are 828 million people in the world who are hungry, and that is two and a half times the U.S. population. 345 million people face extreme hunger and are starving. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of suffering in this world. That's a lot of neighbors who are in need of our generous love. With $9.6 billion, the World Food Program has been able to feed 100 million people in 120 countries and territories. Research shows that it would take about $40 billion a year to end world hunger by 2030. 2030. That is just seven years from now. In seven years, we could feed the world. $40 billion sounds like a lot. I honestly can't comprehend what that means. I don't have tangibles for that number to help me wrap my head around that kind of money. And the executive director of the World Food Program, David Beasley, knows that $40 billion a year sounds like a lot. But he said that in the United States alone, in the last one year, the U.S. billionaire's net worth increase was over $1 trillion. I think I mathed this right, but $1 trillion divided by $40 billion is 25. That's way more than is needed to end hunger in seven years if we need $40 billion a year. The internet tells me that there are 756 billionaires in the U.S. 756 people could solve world hunger over and over and over again just by sharing of the increase of their wealth from one year. The 828 million people go hungry. Ours is a generous God who heard hungry people crying in the wilderness and provided enough each day. Ours is a Savior who fed hungry people. He didn't stop to ask if they deserved the food that he gave them. He didn't ask them to fill out forms or to show an ID. He didn't ask them to prove that they had a need. He just fed them because that's what love looks like. He lifted up the example of generosity of the Good Samaritan that we looked at last week and told us to go do likewise. He said that every time we give food or drink or welcome or clothing or care or company to the least of these, we are doing so to him. He poured out the abundance of God's love and mercy and grace for our sake so that we might have life and have it abundantly. During one of our Two Minute Tuesday live videos on Facebook, I asked folks to share stories of when they had been on the receiving end of generosity and what that experience was like. 
I shared a story about my niece, of course, and her sharing her food with me. But today I'm going to share a different story, a story of generosity that really brought home to me this idea that there is enough to go around. I've shared before that in college my internship was to work at a warming center in the Logan Square neighborhood of Chicago. It was a place where folks could come into the AC in those hot, sweltering summers, and in the winter, they could go somewhere where there was a little bit of heat. It was a humbling experience, and I learned so much about what poverty and hunger look like in America. Our center was small, just a little storefront you wouldn't even notice if you walked by. We mostly served men who were unhoused. Some stayed at shelters, some slept under bridges, some slept on the couches of family or friends. For many of them, all that they had in the whole entire world fit in a backpack. I don't think I've ever experienced such extravagant generosity as I did there. There'd be days when some of the guys just picked up food from the local pantry, or maybe they had a little extra change and got to pick out their favorites from the convenience store down the street. I remember this one guy. He was an immigrant from Mexico trying to scrape out while living in this land of abundance. I think at some point he'd gotten laid off his job at a factory and tried so hard to find something else. He was kind and quiet, and he liked to laugh. He was one of the very fortunate ones at our center because he had, a, he had family in the area, and he was able to stay in his niece's garage. So when he picked up his items from the pantry, that meant that he actually got to do a bit of real cooking. He would make delicious food. If he had enough, he would always bring it into the warming center to share. Sometimes he'd have an extra can of something that he didn't want to use, and he'd bring it up to the window so that I could add it to our big pot of soup. He shared food with me often, with me, this college kid who had Plenty, who was living in a lavishly wealthy neighborhood in a cozy apartment that my internship program provided for me. I'm sure it was obvious to everyone that I had more than enough resources at my disposal, and yet still he shared his food with me. And a lot of the guys did that. Scraping together a meal of canned goods and crackers and hot sauce packets, they threw together something tasty and they shared it with me and my supervisor and the other guys there. So often when they had enough, they were always sharing with those they knew didn't. That was a generosity like I've never experienced anywhere else before. A generosity as grand as the widow's might, a generosity like the kind that Christ calls us to. I want to lift up that there are hungry people right here in our neighborhood who will wake up tomorrow morning longing for manna from heaven. We can be the answer to their prayers when we let our generous God guide our giving. We can be generous with our resources. We can love our neighbors by putting our faith into action and trusting that there is enough in this world to go around. When we pool together our resources especially, we can make a difference in people's lives. Right now at God's Bounty Food Pantry, our neighbors are in need of the fall. Peanut butter, chunky soups, canned fruit, especially pineapple, and canned meats, things like tuna or sausage or chicken. And I'll say that again in case you want to write it down. They are in need of peanut butter, chunky soups, canned fruit, especially pineapple. I don't know why pineapple, but it was on the list. 
and canned meats like tuna, sausages, and chicken. It's a little ways off, but in October, we are going to be doing a big food drive, integrating it into most of our activities and doing what we can to get our pantry stocked ahead of the holidays. The problem of world hunger. The $40 billion that is needed each year to end it for the next seven years, that might be beyond the scope of what we can do here at Zion. But my goodness, we can still feed our neighbors right here in our own community who are hungry right now. One of the gifts of being church, of being the body of Christ, is that our generosity gets amplified by the work that we do together. In the lush garden of Eden, in the wilderness on the way to the promised land, on the shores of Galilee with 5,000 men plus women and children gathered, our generous God provided enough. God has given us a vision of the world where there is enough where none has to go without, where paradise can be experienced here and now. A world with no starving children, a world where neighbors look out for each other, a world that is a little less broken, that's what God invites us to. When we embody the kind of generosity we have received from our wondrous God, when we live out that kind of tangible, abundant love the Good Samaritan did, we begin to build God's kingdom here on earth. Together, as church, let us be generous. Thanks be to God, our wondrously generous God. Amen. Friends, as we consider the ways that we might be generous in our lives, I invite you to turn to page 14 in our blue hymnals. We are going to sing, Now Thank Me All Our God. I think generosity starts with a spirit of gratitude as we recognize all that God has done for us. It's number 14, Now Thank Me All Our God.
We turn now to our time of offering when we get to put our generosity into action. Like manna from heaven, God pours out blessings into our lives, providing for us what we need. In this wondrous world that God has created, there is enough to go around. May the gifts that we bring this day be used for loving our neighbors, for feeding the hungry, for healing the broken, for sharing God's light. For August, our benevolence offering goes to support our church's wider mission. That's the main offering that we collect to support our wider church family and the United Church of Christ, with a big chunk of that staying right here in our Indiana-Kentucky conference, and then some of that going to the denominational setting. And like I said before, I do want to highlight to our ministry with God's Bounty Food Pantry in the next few weeks, if you can bring in peanut butter, chunky soups, canned fruit, especially pineapple, or canned meats like tuna, sausages, or chicken, um, our neighbors would really benefit from that. I put my peanut butter by the door this morning where I usually put my purse so I would remember it, but I put my purse in a different place and I forgot the peanut butter. But next Sunday, I will remember to bring in my peanut butter. So if you can bring in some extra canned goods this week, this next couple of weeks, that would be wonderful. Friends, it is because of your generosity that our ministry here at Zion United Church of Christ continues. It is through your gifts that literally we can keep the lights on and the AC going. And it is because of your generosity that we can continue to do God's work together in this world, loving our neighbors and sharing God's welcome far and wide. So thank you for your generosity and continue to be generous. We lift up our gifts to God this day with gratitude because of the generosity that God has first shown us. Let's join together in singing our doxology. You'll find it on the screen or on those laminated cards in your pews. Sing whichever version is most meaningful to you.
Through the wilderness of life, God's got you in his hands. In your time of need, God's care overflows. When you don't know the path ahead, our generous God is there to guide you. So go forth knowing that God's extravagant, abundant love is always with you. Go forth to embody God's generosity by being Christ's hands and feet in this world. Go in peace to serve and enrich the world around you. Amen. Amen.